Let's bow and pray just for a moment. Lord Jesus, we have come to hear from your word this morning. We have come to hear it through the ears of your spirit. I don't trust that I have the ability to communicate it well enough. I don't trust that the people here have the ability to hear it without that help of the Spirit. And so, Holy Spirit, we're trusting you to speak to us and into our lives today, and we ask that you would empower your word today by your Spirit. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So words are a big deal. Is it an overstatement to say that lives hang in the balance with words? Um, how is influence peddled? How is information, information shaped to affect the decisions that individuals or families or organizations, even churches and governments make? How much do teachers in our schools or preachers or bloggers or political platforms that are written down in words on pages impact all of us? How much do the words in this book impact you? How much are they in your heart? How about the words that you read on Google? How often did you access Google this week to learn something or how to do something? Um, words spoken in pivotal moments of life that direct us one way or another. Words that are heard, sometimes ignored, sometimes accepted. Words that are intended to be believed and sometimes, sadly, words that are offered to be deceptive. How powerful are the words in your head or heart that rule you? Those tapes that you hear over and over again. Who spoke them over you? How long ago? How many of you have words that still ring in your mind and in your heart from when you were children? And you know they still impact you. Were they true? Are they still true? Words. James 3 talks about the tongue talks about the words that we speak, that the tongue is a very small member of our body, but it, it boasts of incredible things, and it says that it, de it can defile the entire body. In Proverbs 18, 21, it says death and life are in the power of the tongue. Hebrews 4 says the Word of God is living and active and powerful. I pray that it is for you this morning. And listen to this tremendous quote from Samuel, who we just referenced earlier. It says that the Lord was with him and let none of his words fail. Can you imagine if that was said about you, that God let none of the words that you spoke fail or fall to the ground in one translation? Words are powerful, and they move people to action, and they also reveal the heart. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 12. For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure, treasure being heart, heart, what is evil? Now, this is the intimidating part. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Who finds that incredibly intimidating? <laughs> that every word, and I'm going to say not just that you speak, but all those words that we write down, that we blog, that we social media, Every one of them. Our text today is all about people speaking words, God's words and Peter and the apostles, their words and the Sanhedrin, what their words were, and then one man in particular, his name is Gamaliel. Let's just contextualize ourselves here to the text before we turn to Acts chapter 5. In the first months of the church, uh, it had been very dramatic for sure. There were powerful forces at work. The Spirit of God was at work, but so were the spirit of Antichrist, and, and they were at loggerheads, and they were battling together. And, uh, and so now the apostles have been arrested twice, and, and then the Holy Spirit sets them free and plunks them right back into the temple, and now the entire apostolic group is back in the Sanhedrin's jail. Uh, the message that the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and most recently the angel of the Lord had instructed them to teach the words that they were to say, it says, speak to the people in the temple the whole message of this life. Speak to them all about the life and salvation that come in Jesus. And they were unapologetically loyal to the risen Lord Jesus, and they were faithfully preaching that word. Can we just take a moment of reflection here? Can I ask you, are you and I unapologetic when it comes to talking about Jesus? Are you unapologetic about the Lord that you serve, about who it is, and what you're all about? 
Well, this whole drama was being played out in a courtroom setting. I should have actually probably talked to a lawyer about the courtroom setting of, of Acts because there's a lot of stuff going on in the courtroom. Uh, the Jewish high court was 71 men, including the high priest himself. The graphic that you can see, we'll be able to see here shortly. Is it coming, Lise? There we go. Uh, that tiny little red dot on the bottom is the little corner of the temple where this room was. But can you imagine being on trial and standing there? Look at the jury around you. I mean, talk about intimidating and the high priest standing there. And these guys were very powerful. And that's where this courtroom was located. It was the chamber of hewn stone just inside of Herod's temple. And it was in this place that the words that were spoken and the decisions that were made definitely changed lives. The Jewish religious and political leadership which were sitting around this outside of this building, they were numerically and politically dominated by the anti-supernatural Sadducees. They did not believe uh, in resurrection or in angels or any of those sorts of things. And, and they had taken a strong dislike to the apostles and what they were preaching. And the stakes were escalating more and more as the witness of the apostles and of what Jesus was doing in the temple was forcing their hand more and more. And when they finally corralled these guys and herd them back into this courtroom, Peter's words of defending Jesus have the Sanhedrin intent on killing them. That's how powerful his words were. And that's the impact that his words had on them. Ironically, when we consider what Jesus said in Matthew 12 about every word being weighed by the Lord, it's clear that the apostles weren't the only ones on trial here, but there was a higher court. Many of you know that when words are being spoken, it's not just what happens in a natural courtroom. It's not just what happens when you're challenged in your faith, but there is a higher judge who is listening to the words as well. And we're all accountable for the positions that we take and the words that we say. But I can... Uh, but. They all claimed uh, truth, but can we, can we lay stake? Could, could you say this about yourself? Uh, Paul would write in 2 Timothy, For this reason I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him. Can you say that? Can you walk and live in this world with the assurance that you are not ashamed of the name of Jesus and that you know who you believe and that you're willing to take your stand and take your stand in his name. The apostles did. And this now is the third time. And, and so they've gone quietly with the temple guard. And why not? Last time the Lord sprung them. But of course, the Sadducees don't believe. In fact, in Acts 23, we actually learn that the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angels, nor a spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledge these things. So the, the Sanhedrin, this court, although it was dominated by the Sadducees, the Pharisees were not anti-supernatural. And so we're going to see that this little bit of a rift actually creates some space for God to use. What are the charges that are against them? First, you ignored our words. That's what the Sanhedrin said. We told you not to preach and you did anyway. Peter and John had not obeyed the official orders to stop preaching in the name of Jesus. Second, they said, we don't like your words. Not only did you stop, but we don't like what you say when you do speak. Their witness of the resurrection was directly refuting the Sadducees' doctrine, and they did not like it. And they said, you filled Jerusalem with this doctrine. So Peter has outright assigned them blame for Jesus' death. And shockingly, what people do in the heat of the moment, they often deny afterwards. This same group, in their jealousy of Jesus, had cried at Jesus' trial, what should we do with Jesus? Crucify him. And then they said, let his blood be on us and our children. And all Peter did was say, don't you remember when you said that? You were guilty. You did that. But now, in their jealousy, they are after these guys. But as blame's package has arrived at the door, blame that they welcomed, let his blood be on us and our children, now they claim they're not responsible for it. They don't want to sign for it. You ever order something from Amazon? And then not want it? These guys placed the order, but when the repercussions came down, they did not want it. However, denial doesn't erase our history. And Peter wasn't letting them off the hook. They were convicted by their conscience, and they were convicted by their words. The third thing that they'd done, the real and understated reason, was that they were filled with envy at the great success and the un 
that these untrained and unauthorized men were having. They knew that their traditions had nowhere near the impact on the lives of people that they were watching unfold in the temple, and that made them furious. Even envy can be hidden under the disguise of defending the faith, and so under that disguise, they have arrested the disciples. They took the gospel success as a personal attack on their role, on their theology, on their credibility, and on their popularity, and they were going to defend it at all costs. And they haven't learned a thing since the trial of Jesus. They're about to make the same mistake they made with Jesus all over again. In Ephesians 4, it says, Be angry but do, and, do, and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. How many of you have learned that your anger and your temper can get you in a lot of trouble? <laughs> Whose big mouth has gotten them in a lot of trouble? I remember playing a hockey game in Claremont and there was a guy who was a very dirty hockey player on the other team. I was playing out there with Russell, and Russell told me to shut up, but I didn't. And so this guy was dirty, and I was beaking him from the bench. I was standing on the bench, and he came by the bench, and he says, well, you going to say that again? And I said, yeah, I'll say it again. And as I started talking, he just reached over the bench and punched me in the face. <laughs> <laughs> and Russell was laughing, and I kind of thought, well, you asked for that one, didn't you? Because <laughs> he was a big guy. Has your anger ever gotten you punched in the face? Maybe not, but it's probably gotten you in trouble. And these guys, in their anger, were prepared to murder the apostles. And they were getting in trouble. They had given the enemy an opportunity to take over their hearts. And remember, the things that you say are a reflection of your heart. And so we could see what was in these guys' hearts. They are out of their minds angry to find that the gospel of Christ had so much to recommend it that it was likely to keep gaining ground and that they were absolutely powerless to offer anything to compete with what Jesus was doing for the people. And so when Peter peached, uh, when Peter peached, <laughs> when Peter preached the same message to the masses after Pentecost, it says that they responded with godly sorrow and thousands got saved. He preached almost the identical message to the Sanhedrin, and it says that these leaders were cut to the heart, but their reaction was to actually threaten to kill them all. <laughs> How different is the response to the same message? Just a moment of reflection here. Is it worth, a worth asking whose fault it is when you go to church and get nothing out of the message? Just a thought. The same message produced repentance unto salvation and produced a murder plot. The same words. Enraged, the Sadducean contingent is calling for the death sentence, but the Pharisaic members of this court, although they're in the minority, have more credibility with the people. And you'll remember when the temple guards went to arrest them, they were actually afraid of the people. And so they couldn't do whatever they wanted to do without getting the Pharisees on their side. And there was one exceptional man who would now speak up into this trial. He's a unique figure, and we're introduced to Gamaliel in Acts 5, verse 34 to 40. Turn there in your Bibles if you haven't already. So we read, But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the defendants out, outside for a short time. So Gamaliel is a celebrated uh, uh, Jewish uh, wise teacher. He is the son of Simeon, probably the same Simeon who, when Jesus was brought to the temple, recognized who Jesus was. This was his, his son. And he was the grandson of a great Bible teacher, a great Old Testament scholar uh, called Hillel, who, had a, who actually had a college. It was like a Bible school. And uh, Gamaliel would eventually take over this school. Uh, he was a celebrated rabbi and a great teacher of the law, it says. He was also the teacher of Saul, who would become Paul, and later becomes the president of the Sanhedrin. He is the first one to be given the name, not just rabbi, but rabbon, which was an elevated title. It would be like a, a, a I don't know what it would be like. It, it, it would just, it would, but it wasn't just a teacher. He was like a, um, uh, 
he, he was regarded as the highest authority on the Scriptures of his day. And so he had tremendous credibility. And so Gamaliel is not a Sadducee, but he's so respected that they actually listen to him. He appears here as a loyal Pharisee, as a doctor of the law. And that phrase is used by Luke to also describe those who would come to Jesus with theological puzzles. Do you remember how they'd always try to catch Jesus? Okay, so if a man marries a woman and then he dies and then his brother marries him and then all seven brothers marry him and so on, whose wife will she be in the eternity? Like those kind of questions, like these kind of conundrums. And so they kept trying to trap Jesus, but that was actually the kind of doctor of the law that Gamaliel was. He was a theological student, and they knew the word really well. He was a man of judicial temper, according to history, and he wasn't prone to go off on the tangent like the Sadducees had gone. And so there's uh, Gamaliel. Why he defends the apostles in the text to come isn't actually very clear. Was it to make a point against the theology of the Sadducees? Could be. Was it to preserve the integrity of the law and of this court? Maybe. Uh, was it to keep from repeating the fiasco that Jesus' trial and death had become? Because this had become a tremendous problem for them. We're not really sure. But we pick up his words and it says, He said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you propose to do with these men. His address to them, men of Israel, he's basically saying, listen, good leaders are not emotional reactionaries. You need caution. And he feels compelled to call them to just stop and think about what they're doing before they make a huge mistake. And he's going to do that in private, not in front of the, the apostles. And so he says, men of Israel, get, basically he says, get a hold of yourselves. Get a grip. Get a grip. You're not acting like the leaders of a nation. You're acting like a bunch of emotional, insane people. Your, your, your anger has driven you mad. And you're, uh, you are supposed to be the leading men of Israel, governed by reason, governed by revelation, not like heathens who pay no regard to what God has said and who don't know His Word. And so he says, take heed to yourselves and to your anger, lest you do something you regret. So, they, so he's, first of all, he's stopping them. I also think he maybe removed the apostles because the Sanhedrin needed a timeout. <laughs> Have you ever given a kid a timeout because they just were out of control? These guys needed a timeout. So we pick it up in his argument. He goes on to say, For some time ago, uh, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about 400 men joined up with him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed, and it came to nothing. Verse 37, after this man, Judas of Galilee, rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him, and he too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. Who are these two figures in history? We don't really know who the first guy is, but Judas of Galilee might be the one who history does recount. Josephus gives a rather full account of it, and, and in the Gospel of Luke chapter 13, it describes, it says, somebody came to tell Jesus about Pilate who had mingled the Galilean sacrifices, the blood of the sacrifices with their blood. This may be, have, have been this uprising, Judas of Galilee. Now, the Galileans were kind of known to be troublemakers. And by the way, where was Jesus from? Yeah. And these guys were rebellious. There was constantly these rebellions, and they were putting these things down all the time. And so, so there was definitely some examples that they could look at to say, listen, these guys come and go, and Jesus will be one of those guys who come and go, but not if you turn this into a murderous fiasco. And so he's, he's trying to make a case. So he says in verse 38, and so in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone. For this plan or action is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it's of God, you will not be able to overthrow them, or you may even be found fighting against God. Now, I've often read these words and thought Gamaliel was a real voice of reason. And I think God was able to use him to certainly spare the lives of the apostles in this case. And it all sounds reasonable, but I would suggest to you today that Gamaliel is hardly objective. And the title of my message this morning is Living Gray in a Black and White World. And this is what Gamaliel's about to try to do. He's going to try to live the gray space between two completely opposite sides. 
And I'm going to think we're going to find out, and there are some lessons to learn. So while he is moderate in his approach, this is a chance for the Sanhedrin to actually get to the bottom of this debate. This is a once-in-a-lifetime debate. They have a legitimate example and miraculous events happening around them. This could actually be the coming of the promised Messiah. Now, they weren't sure. We know by history that Jesus certainly was the real deal. But give them a little grace and say, in the moment, they didn't know. But here's Gamaliel and the Sanhedrin. They had a chance to do a full investigation to really figure out who is this Jesus? What's really happening? Does this line up with Scripture? This was the moment to dig in and settle it. There was a chance to figure out what is black and what is white. But they blow it. They miss it. We can see his bias. If he was defending them, he should have allowed, shouldn't have allowed their brutal whipping. Because later on, they don't kill them, but they whip them with 39 lashes. Now, many people actually died from that whipping. This, was no, this wasn't a spanking. This was a flogging. What he does right is that he remains civil in the face of tremendous heated situation. That's a good example. And when the Sanhedrin is openly challenges the apostles' gospel, he speaks up on their defense for proper procedure. And so he remains civil and he speaks up. That's good. But he also makes some mistakes. I think we can say that he's probably not truly open-minded to consider the evidence before him. What does he presume? This Jesus is just like the other two guys, the other two examples, because he's using them as illustrations. It's probably like that. He's already prejudged the case. And so while he's being moderate, he's also being biased. And then he fails to apply his convictions to their logical conclusion. Because if what he says is true, that we could actually find ourselves fighting against God... So we should leave these guys alone. Then he should have also defended them from a flogging. Because in the case that they are actually of God, we don't want to be flogging God's servants. So why did he let them get flogged? Because sometimes you and I, and sometimes even great leaders and teachers like Gamaliel, can get drawn into a gray world where we try to straddle both sides of the issue. Have you ever been guilty of compromise? of saying something but leaving a bit on the table too, not maybe going all the way, not wanting to confront, not wanting to hurt, not wanting to insult, not wanting to tell someone they're a sinner who needs to repent and Jesus, needs Jesus. <laughs> Have we ever pulled it, pulled the punch a little bit? The biggest weakness of his advice was his motive. He encouraged neutrality to the council, but was facing a life and death issue that demanded a decision. Wait and see is actually not being neutral. Flogging them is not being neutral. Gamaliel was voting no, but he was preaching maybe, and it was confusing. Let's just stop and think about that for a moment. Do we ever take partial stands for the truth? I've debated theology with atheists, with agnostics, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and even occasionally with a Muslim. That one wasn't very deep, but, but we did chat for a bit. And I'll have to say that though we were all trying to convert each other, right? I mean, that's what's going on, right? We're arguing about what's true. We're all trying to convert each other. One thing that all of those conversations had in common was at least we all understood we're not all right. We're not. We can't all be right because we're saying different things. And, you know, there's just an honesty about that. Even in debating theology and debating who Jesus is with people of other religions, at least we know that, that we're not all saying the same thing. I think this all paths lead to heaven is a Gamaliel approach to spiritual life. It's just not true. All these different paths cannot lead to the same place. These different versions of who Jesus is are not the same Jesus. And so it's okay to say that. It's okay to acknowledge that when we have a conversation with people. Because when you're saying different things, 
One plus one cannot equal two, three, or four. There is a right answer, and we're looking for it. And I think we can all trust God to lead people of good conscience who are seeking the truth to find it. And so spiritual compromise, especially in our culture, is expected and even applauded. But I'm sorry, it's just not a possibility for us as Christians. It's disingenuous to tell somebody, well, that's good. It's good that you believe in a God. That's not evangelism. I'm not sure what it is. I think it's living gray in a black and white world. I think we need to make sure that we declare all of the message of this life. That was what the angel told them to preach. And all that said, Gamaliel's words have an impact on the trial. <laughs> whatever he wanted to do, whatever he was trying to do, it does have an impact. God is able to use it. And they took his advice, it says in verse 40, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and released them again. Well, I think a pattern is developing. <laughs> if Gamaliel was really not wanting to fight against God, why didn't he honestly investigate it? This was the moment. Daniel Defoe, who was the author of Robinson Crusoe, claimed that nobody was born a coward. He said this, Truth makes a man of courage, and guilt makes a man of courage into a coward. The apostles were true ambassadors of God. Gamaliel was being a religious politician. And that's not the same. Saul, who was his disciple... We know about him, and you're going to learn about him in the days to come through Pastor Steve's messages. Saul, we know, would go about terrorizing the church. He would become the attack dog of the Sanhedrin. But when he was confronted by Jesus on the Damascus road, Saul made a better decision that day than Gamaliel made. Saul made a decision to surrender to Christ. Gamaliel while he may have defended the apostles and the correct legal proceedings of the moment, he did not manage to save his own soul. He did not make the decision concerning Jesus. In spite of the bloody beating, we read in verse 41 and 2, the apostles left the Sanhedrin. What? What? They were flogged within an inch of their life and they're bleeding and they drag their bloody carcasses out of this room, out of this place, and they do what? They're rejoicing. I just want to say right up front, I have not mastered that. I have not mastered rejoicing at persecution, re rejoicing at being called names, rejoicing at being told I'm an idiot for believing in Jesus. I, I have a hard time not being angry. But there are lessons to be learned, and it says that the apostles were honored to be suffering disgrace for Jesus. In later years, Peter would have much to say about the role of suffering in his epistle, the meaning of suffering in the life of the believer, and it was here and now that he was learning those lessons that he would reflect on later and write in letters to the church. The opposition of men meant the approval of God. And it was actually a privilege to suffer for Jesus, who had suffered for them. Peter encourages Christians to rejoice when they participate in the things of God, including suffering for Jesus' name. Can we draw a couple lessons about what happens today? Number one, let's determine not to try live gray in the places where Jesus has told us, no, this world is black and white. How many of you are committed to that? That's surprisingly few people for a church service. If you put your hand up, God will watch. And he'll help you. Do you remember when God said, don't fear when you're called to give an account for the things you say when you're brought before kings and authorities? I will tell you in that very moment exactly what you should say. Don't worry about being inadequate. 
Just share and witness what you know. But don't be afraid to be white in a black world. And don't compromise your way down to gray. Be willing to stand for Jesus. I think some other lessons too. I'd like to say that when you come into confrontation like the apostles did, like Gamaliel was in, the Sanhedrin were murderous. I mean, there was intensity here, right? I would say that when we're in conflict situations, it's easier to fight than it is to talk and listen. But one thing that Gamaliel did right was he calmed people down a bit and there was able to be some talking. <laughs> I don't know if there was listening, but at least there was talking. And I think sometimes when we get into disagreements on the basis of principle and truth, it often reverts to verbal and sometimes even physical violence, sometimes both. It's a huge challenge to listen to somebody of another opinion and remain humble, and most importantly, to stay Christ-like. Have you ever felt defensive over your faith? Have you ever felt attacked and wanted to lash out in anger at those who would attack you for your belief in Jesus? That's not what the disciples did. It's not what Jesus did. In fact, Jesus was quiet at his trial. He didn't even feel the need to defend himself. He didn't feel like he answered to them. He didn't answer to Pilate. He answered to God until eventually he did say something. We have a tragic history of branding all of our wars as holy wars and branding all of our fights with the name of Jesus. But if we're going to use Jesus' name and fight for his cause, we need to not only fight for what Jesus talks about, but fight like Jesus fights. We need to wage the battle in the way Jesus would wage it. And that means we have to maintain a Christ-like heart and a Christ-like attitude. You know, later on, Saul has now become Paul, and it says that the first thing Paul did every time he went to a new place to share the gospel, he would start in the synagogue with the people that he had once been a part of, and he would try bring them to Christ. And the early church always tried to bring their brethren, to bring the other Jewish people into the kingdom of God, in spite of how they'd been treated, in spite of how they'd been persecuted and attacked. They still try to bring them to Jesus. That is like Jesus. William Temple said that Christians are called to the hardest of all tasks, to fight without hatred, to resist without bitterness, and in the end, if God should grant it, to triumph without vindictiveness. When I look back at the last two years, I, I'm afraid that the North American church largely failed during covid not failed to be black and white, but failed to be like Jesus. Failed to reflect Him. Our heart were exposed by our words, and not just by the content of them, but by the tone of them. And I can't help but think that I heard a lot of angry Christians over the last two years. How many of you heard it too? Angry, frustrated, I get it. Can I admit that I'm one of them? <laughs> but you keep that inside, and when you're in the world, you are there as a representative, an ambassador of Jesus. And I think what Peter and the apostles did in the face of now three trials and threats and now a scourging to maintain the Christ-likeness of their Lord was just an amazing example to us. Jesus said, and I would say this just looking back at Gamaliel's situation, he said, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. The gray world is not on Jesus' side. <laughs> Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me before man, I'll be ashamed of you before my father. I don't want the Lord to be ashamed of me. I don't want to live my life halfway in the in the kingdom and then come to the end and find out that it was all for naught <laughs> because I was afraid to be black and white. I'm not saying go looking for trouble. I'm just saying be, be Christian. Speak the truth in the greatest of love.
with the greatest of humility and take Jesus' side. In the world that's coming, in the battles that are coming, it's going to be a challenging world. And there won't be room for gray. I want to encourage you to be courageous. In Romans 10, it says, If we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with our mouth, we confess, resulting in salvation. Can you be a non-confessional Christian? Can you be a secret Christian without letting anybody know, without ever naming the name of Jesus? I wouldn't want to try. I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want to take the, the gamble. Don't be ashamed of your faith. Gamaliel is wise and he's prudent. He is a learned man of the law. But if there's one thing that his life was supposed to stand for, it was supposed to be the defense of truth and contending for the truth of God's word in a nation where he was a leader. And when it came to that, he may have preserved the disciples' life, but we don't know if he ever got to the place where he preserved his own by submitting to Jesus. And every day, in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus. That's our task. Every day, in the temple, in our community, from house to house, let's take our stand for Jesus. Go and stand, the angel told them, and speak to the people in the temple this whole message of this life. You have the words in your heart that can change forever somebody's eternity. You have the words in your heart that change lives forever. Don't keep them to yourself. Let them be heard. Let's bow and pray. Heavenly Father, as we speak these words this morning, I want to thank you for the word of God which is uncompromising in its truth. And Lord, you teach us often to be gracious and kind and gentle and all those things, but you also teach us to speak the truth. And Father, I want to pray for each one who is here this morning, that we would be a reflection and that we would be vocal. <laughs> That's unfortunate timing, eh? <laughs> that we would take our stand for the truth. Lord, we're not distracted by a phone. We understand what we're talking about here this morning. If you want to be that kind of believer that doesn't walk the gray world but knows black and white, but you're not sure you're qualified, you're not sure you'll have the words, but you want the Holy Spirit to help you just be that black and white, honest, straightforward person, would you just raise your hand this morning? Lord, you can see that we're not sure what's coming at us in these days, but one thing we do know, that you promised to be with us and you promised us the Holy Spirit who would help us and give us words. And so, Lord, for each one this morning who's willing to be salt and light in this world, I want to pray for a fresh anointing a fresh touch of the Spirit, and a fresh confidence that you will be with us, a fresh confidence that you will give us the words to speak in the right way that will touch people's hearts and lives. Holy Spirit, would you please give us opportunity to name your name and to share with people the life-changing message of the gospel? We ask for this, Lord, humbly, not to be troublemakers, not to be combative, but to be conduits for others to the knowledge of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the example of the Scripture. And I pray, Lord, you'll help us to live the example you're giving us today from your Word. And is there anyone here this morning who's never made a commitment to Jesus Christ? Did you know you have to repent of your sin? <laughs> Maybe nobody's told you. Well, the Word of God is telling us. But if you believe Jesus has raised from the dead, and you believe that he died for your sin, and you're willing to give your life to him and invite him in, he will cleanse you, he will make you a new creation, and your life will be changed. And if you're here this morning and you've never made that decision, but you'd like to, I'd like you just to raise your hand. All of our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, but if you've never made that choice, I want to give you the chance. I'm looking up in the balcony. God bless you. Is there anyone else? We're going to pray.
because somebody's raised their hand this morning. So can we all pray out loud together? And, and if you didn't raise your hand, but you pray this prayer with sincerity, I believe God's going to listen to you this morning, and you're going to receive a gift of life. Pray, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross to save us from our sin. We acknowledge that we have needed a Savior. I confess my sin to you, Lord. I've run my life my own way without regard for you. But today, Lord, I want to live for you. And so I invite you, be my Lord and my Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me and make me new. I thank you that you're going to help me walk this new world, this new life, by the power of your Spirit. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you've prayed that prayer, that's the confession part. With our mouths we confess. You've made a confession. But the Bible says that salvation that saves starts with the belief in the heart. And the belief of the heart produces righteousness. It produces follow-through. So I want to encourage you now that you've made this profession, I want to encourage you to follow through. Tell those who you know who are Christians that you've made this commitment. Begin to expect God to change your appetites, your affections, your language, some of the life decisions you've been making in the past that new things will come and some old things will pass away. This is the true evidence that you've entered the kingdom of God. And we want to help you. Let us know. We want to walk with you and encourage you as you go.